before we begin to understand the relationship between socialism and ethics, we need to acquaint ourselves with the ethics of capitalism. One does not have to look very far to encounter the practical morality of the present social system. You only have to go to the prisons where those who transgress against the dictatorship of property are thrown into human scrapyards of brutality and isolation to see how the ethics of profit are maintained. Or look at the police cells where the point of morality is conveyed via the boot of the law enforcer and you will see how capitalism persuades its moral nonconformists into the ways of goodness. Or go to the schools where a new generation of children is being mentally polluted because the needs of capital require economic and emotional servility and repression from its future wage slaves. Go to those places where millions are starving amidst mountains of food while Christian preachers tell them that they are selfish and greedy. The moral apologists for capitalism have plenty to say, but I would argue nothing worth listening to. Their principles of social conduct are the principles of undisturbed capitalist conduct. They self-righteously deprecate the Auschwitzes and the Dachau's while justifying the long caches and the Wormwood Scrubs. They deplore the sexual promiscuity of the young while the profit system turns human desires into commodity relationships to be regulated by the commercial dictates of fashion and to be satisfied only through the marketplace. They are revolted by the idea of women selling their bodies to men, which amongst the morally decent is supposed to be done as a wholesale transaction by the legal means of a marriage contract. But if workers did not sell the power of their bodies to capitalists, which is a highly moral form of prostitution from the angle of the exploiter, the entire profit system would cease to function. They indignantly moralise against the violence of those who should be putting their energies to more exploitable use, but the ethics of mass slaughter by the weaponry of the state is manifested by the award of medals to the legal perpetrators of international destruction. The cries of indignation with which capitalism's moralists respond to the unfortunate worker who is caught stealing back some of the wealth which he has produced is only balanced by the cries of moral sanctification with which the legalised robbery of the wages system is praised as being the highest form of economic benevolence. So... The sweet-smelling morality of capitalism does not in any way serve to hide the foul stench of a system in which the privileged few can only perpetuate themselves and their positions of authority by means of the parasitic destruction of the feelings and the hopes and the potentialities of the class which is compelled to labour because it does not own. The ethics of capitalism echo in every sense the needs of capital. They can never do other than that. The ethics of any age reflect the class needs of those who dominate the age. It's a fundamental principle of Marxism that the struggle against capitalism is not a conflict between competing abstract images of how society ought to be, but is an historically determined part of the process of humanity bringing its social relations into line with the productive forces. The young Hegelians in the Germany of the 1830s represented the conventional progressive standpoint of seeking a better society by means of ethical regeneration. For them, social transformation depended upon people freeing themselves from their false ideas. Marx recognised quite correctly that this approach simply amounted to attacking the shadow 
in the hope that the body would therefore be destroyed. In Britain, in the mid-19th century, there was a good deal of this kind of shadow chasing going on, mainly by well-intentioned critics of the new industrial system who were largely from the higher and more privileged sections of society and who felt ethically out of harmony with the new ways of living which the Industrial Revolution had brought with it. Marx criticises these idealist critics of industrial capitalism, whom he refers to as feudal socialists. He criticises them with considerable wit, if not a somewhat undue harshness. And he refers to their social criticism as being, I quote, half lamentation, half lampoon half echo of the past, half menace of the future, at times by its bitter, witty and incisive criticism, striking the capitalist class to the very heart's core, but always ludicrous in its effect, through total incapacity to comprehend the march of modern history. The unhistorical nature of this criticism did not weaken the passion and the ability with which it was stated. The two most able spokesmen of the so-called romantic revolt against industrialism in Britain were Thomas Carlyle and John Ruskin. Carlyle was offended by the tendency within industrial capitalism to reduce all values to what he called the cash nexus. In 1843, Carlyle wrote a very important book, Past and Present, in which he described the alienation of capitalism in terms which were not that different from those used by Marx in his Paris manuscripts written a year later. Uh, To quote from it, Carlyle writes, We call it a society and go about professing openly the totalist separation and isolation. Our life is not a mutual helpfulness, but rather cloaked under the due laws of war named fair competition. It is a mutual hostility. We have profoundly forgotten everywhere that cash payment is not the sole relation of human beings. Similarly, Ruskin was as passionate and as clear in attacking the contradictions of this new industrial society. His most important work, The Stones of Venice, He remarks how capitalism can, I quote, manufacture everything except men. We blanch cotton and strengthen steel and refine sugar and shape pottery, but to brighten, to strengthen, to refine, or to form a single living spirit never enters into our estimate of advantages. So it was out of this movement of romanticism, of idealism, of passionate moral indignation, that the revival of the idea of socialism emerged in Britain in the late 1870s. The most prominent philosopher of the new Marxist movement, which took form in the 1880s, was Ernest Belfort Bats. Bats became a socialist in 1871, at the age of 16, upon reading accounts of the slaughter of the 30,000 communards in Paris. In 1875, he went to Stuttgart to study music, and this enabled him to make contact with European Marxists. His studies of German philosophy led him to read Marx's Capital, and Bats, in fact, published an article on Marx's ideas in a British journal journal which was called Modern Thought. And Marx regarded Bats's exposition of Marxism as being, I quote, the first English publication of the kind which is pervaded by a real enthusiasm for the new ideas themselves and boldly stands up against British Philistinism. And between 1885 and 1895, Bats was undoubtedly, including Morris, the most important writer of the Marxist movement in relation to philosophical and dialectical thought. During that period, he wrote eight books, he wrote over 50 articles in socialist journals, and he wrote a number of other writings in collaboration with William Morris. He was a regular contributor to the socialist league journal Commonweal, and also a prominent speaker. Bax's two major essay collections, The Religion of Socialism, 
and the ethics of socialism contain a mixture of the most readable materialist insights of the period, together with a number of writings which bear the hallmarks of the Romantic Revolt, which is still stuck to some extent in those ethical frameworks, together, of course, with a few essays which must be entirely dismissed as being eccentric wanderings of an active mind, in particular Bax's writings on the question of the equality of the sexes can certainly be dismissed in that way. Bax was the first Marxist to concentrate on the subject of ethics. Marx had started by stating that morality was no more than a superstructural reflection of the economic material base. In fact, Marx didn't see this as being a direct mechanistic reflection, that here you have the economic system and here you have a, a simple reflection of ideas. He, in fact, used a word which meant a, a, a mirroring in a broad sense of following through the economic tendencies within the area of thought. The ruling ideas of any society, according to Marx, are always the ideas which are in the interests of the ruling class. The ruling class being the class which owns and controls the means of producing and distributing wealth. Marx described his own social theory as being scientific rather than moralistic. His collaborator Engels actually argued that Marx was the uh, Darwin of social science, a a, a claim which uh, can be extended too far either way, but nevertheless... This was the scientific approach which Marx saw himself as taking. Material factors, rather than their ethical reflections, are the stuff from which real history is made, according to Marx. Uh, To quote him, communists preach no morality at all. He wrote this in The Poverty of Philosophy. Socialists, according to Marx, make no normative judgments. That is to say, they make no statements about how things ought to be. The scientific socialist concern is with the course of history in line with the scientifically perceived laws of social motion. No more and no less. And that, in brief, is the claim of Marxism as being beyond ethics, as being scientific. And it is this claim which I intend to examine in this lecture. Let's first consider the arguments put by those who deny the scientific and non-ethical basis of the case for socialism. Emil Durkheim certainly rejected the scientific claim of Marx's writings. He wrote, What gave birth to them and constitutes their strength is the thirst for a more perfect justice. Socialism is not a science, it is a cry of pain. An eminent writer within the Yugoslav Paxis group wrote in 1975, shortly before that group was banned in Yugoslavia and its leading members were in prison, he wrote that, I quote, Marxism is a body of thought which is uncompromising in its rejection of all forms of human alienation, exploitation, oppression and injustice, regardless of the type of society, capitalist or socialist, in which these phenomena occur. According to these thinkers, socialism is no less an ethical proposition than any other political or social proposition would be. The fact that socialists do not remain mechanistically indifferent to the coming of the next historical stage, but we actually want it to come about, we like the idea of free access and equality and peace and so on, that makes socialism an ethical case. They would say that Marx was kidding himself when he claimed to be expounding an amoral scientific theory. They would say that the Marxists of the 1880s were arrogant when they assumed that their opposition to capitalism was scientific, whereas the early Romantic revolt was of a less serious, merely ethical nature. And as far as the Socialist Party of Great Britain is concerned, far from being the bringers of the objective laws of social evolution to the working class, as we think we are, we are, in fact, just another band of thinkers who have a good idea about how society ought to be. That is what the critics of this position would say. And we may indeed have a very good idea, they would say, but 
socialism, even if it is a better idea than capitalism, can only be proposed as a superior ethical alternative because it presupposes a choice. Well, that is the reverse claim to the one put by scientific socialists, including Marx. If Marxists are to retain scientific credibility, if they are to continue calling themselves, or we are to continue calling ourselves, scientific socialists, then Marxism has to answer the suggestion that it is an ethical theory. Now, the best way for me to demonstrate that Marxism is not a morality or a theory of ethics, and that socialism is not, in ethical terms, simply a good idea, is by following through some of the most common ethical arguments which are described as being socialist or socialistic. We shall see that without materialism, the case for socialism is superficially an attractive one, but politically a quite meaningless one. Now, with the help of Bax's writings, let me deal with three of these ethical approaches. Firstly, there is the ethical condemnation of capitalism. They would argue, the critics of Marx as a science, that you can only condemn the system on ethical grounds. Secondly, there is the case for a just society. They would argue, the critics of Marxism as a science, that socialism is proposed because it is just. Thirdly, there is the ethics of choice. Again, those who would argue that Marxism is not a science would argue that wherever there is a choice to be made, ethical theory has to be brought into it. The ethical condemnation of capitalism is no new phenomenon on the British left. For as long as this particular form of exploitation and oppression has existed, there have been people who have said that it is evil, that it is somehow iniquitous, that it is morally to be condemned. Now, superficially, one would not wish to argue against people who say this. When radical vicars sermonise about the iniquities of mass starvation and concerned labourites say that nuclear bombs are morally obscene, we may well nod along, as one does to an old familiar tune. And nodding to the ethical tune is probably an important initial stage in becoming a socialist. I'll come on to that relationship between this gut feeling of opposition to a capitalist way of life and the rational understanding a little later. But the ethical critique of the system, when pursued as a political end in itself, has certain mistaken assumptions. The most mistaken of them is to see social affairs in terms of the moral culpability of the participants. The capitalist class as exploiters, oppressors and parasites are condemned as being evil, greedy, immoral people. The superficial fact that this is often true should not blind us to the more important social observation that even if the capitalists were the most well-intentioned, selfless, sociable people, as of course a few black sheep among them are, that would not for a moment alter the oppressive, exploitative, parasitical nature of their class position. A capitalist who ceased to indulge in the exploitation of his workforce would soon become a wage slave himself. Now Bax had nothing but contempt for those wealthy young radicals of his day who thought that it was morally more decent to live in poverty than to accept the privileges of their class position. This is how Bax put it, a good half century incidentally, but for Paul Foot and certain other well-off radicals were gassing their moralistic sentiments in the name of socialism. With the sentimental or semi-sentimental socialism of the middle classes, there is mingled a good deal of half-unconscious camp. There is a sort of feeling that poverty, squalor, and causes are in themselves sacred. And the good young man, who instead of joining the YMCA takes to studying social questions, seems to think it incumbent on him to develop a taste for sordid habits and surroundings. A worthy person with aspect of spotless cleanliness and refinement was heard to explain recently in a moment of wild enthusiasm 
that he had rather sleep in a bed infested by noisome insects than eat and drink the wedding breakfast of a baron. Now, this sentiment, it seems to me, is more fitting in the mouth of a retired bacon factor turned vestryman and presiding at a soup kitchen who wants to, to keep the poor contented with their lot rather than in that of a socialist. Beds, as above, are within the reach of all, even the poorest of our brethren, but baronet's breakfasts are certainly not within the reach of all. Now, if the beds in question are better than the baronet's breakfast, wherefore do we seek economic reconstruction? The present system supplies even the reserve army of industry with beds of this descri- description upon demand at the casual war, and does not trouble them with Yorkshire hams, cold fowl, and champagne, but gives them rather meat and drink in keeping with the beds. So on the whole, we live under the best possible of systems in the best possible of worlds. I had always thought socialists wanted to bring the baronet's breakfast within the reach of all, and only leave enough frowsy beds to supply the wants of eccentric persons like our friend. Again, I know of a young man who thinks it an act of socialistic virtue, uh, not an unfortunate necessity, mind, to live on 15 shillings a week with wife and children. He started with the view of proving that, after all, money is rather an encumbrance than otherwise to noble aspirations. Now, I really think this young man ought to be decorated by Baron Rothschild or the Liberty and Property Defence League. If he could prove his thesis, no more crushing argument could be brought against those who doubt the perfection of the present system to satisfy all human requirements. Others, again, pretend to like dropping ages a vile, cockney corruption of language having only an incidental connection with distinctions between classes, dirty hands, and uncomfortable third-class carriages, and many other nasty things, and all because of socialism. This is very silly, perhaps, but more or less harmless. When, however, middle-class young men take to virtuously entering an already overstocked labour market, and thus doing the proletarian in more than one sense. The same cannot be said. It is surprising that these essentially individualist and bourgeois notions of the superiority of poverty and squalor, and of the virtue of self-mortification for the mere sake of it, and without any ulterior social object, which are radically inconsistent with socialism, could ever come to be regarded as having any part or lot with socialism, the end and aim of which is to abolish all these things. Well, you've all, no doubt, met the self-styled radical who tells you that Margaret Thatcher is a monster and Reagan's nuclear bombs are obscene and the luxury of private hospital beds are morally indefensible. Now, I would say, by all means, give these people a nod and a smile. That's probably all that they want. But in terms of understanding the problem, what can be the ethical conclusion of all this, except that those who act badly should act well? What, in other words, can be the conclusion of this kind of an ethical critique, except to say to people that you're calling upon people who at the moment are living lives of luxury, at the moment are carrying out the necessities of their class position, to stop doing that and to act in the interest of the class which they're currently exploiting. Another aspect of the attitude I've described is the notion that the class which is oppressed and exploited are the salt of the earth. Uh, This is a kind of a patronising attitude all too common on the British left of the good old working class who are the salt of the earth. This is a certain kind of radical mythology which has emerged out of the ethical critique of capitalism and which assumes that there's something intrinsically decent about the working class. According to this belief, if only the banks were run by dockers and the prisons were run by nurses and all police inspectors were people who had been recruited from the um, worst uh, council estates in London, the evil society of the present would be transformed into a humanised form of capitalism. Bats, again with a certain amount of wit and ability, deals with this argument. 
It will be observed that I make no distinction here in favour of the working class as such. Many people are apt to think of the new society as essentially the same as the present, only with the relative positions of classes changed. They have a confused notion of the gentle stockbroker being bullied by the coarse and brutal factory hand. They cannot realise that under a developed socialist <coughs> system, the workman type of today and the middle class type of today will be alike as extinct as the dodo. Out of the changed conditions, a new type must necessarily arise, differing from any of those at present existing. For these all presuppose class conditions. All class character as class character is bad. Were the working man any more than the middle class man an angel, socialism would be unnecessary. Socialists who recognize individual character to be the child of social condition could not expect a class degraded materially to the condition of proletarianism not to bear the mark of this degradation on the character of its members. To ethically criticise capitalism is to condemn it with its own weapons. Uh, as I said, there is some superficial attraction in any kind of ethical criticism of capitalism, just as there is a superficial satisfaction in exposing to the congregation that the vicar was recently seen with a prostitute in King's Cross. But of course, capitalism can only survive by hypocritically breaching and updating its own ethics. A capitalist class couldn't possibly con con continue in that position of privilege without breaking the rules which they set for other people and even to some extent for thans themselves. But even if it did not break its own rules, the fact that its shadow was in direct line with the system it is shadowing does not in any way resolve the contradictions within the capitalist system itself. Even if every capitalist acted and exploited the working class with the utmost morality and uh, purity, that would not for a second deny the existence of the exploitative process. There is an ethical response to what I have just said, and it need, neatly leads us on to the second ethical argument which I said I would deal with. This is the proposition that socialism equals justice. According to such an argument, capitalism is unjust because it deprives workers of the fruits of their labour, it allows a minority to have unearned privilege, and it is profoundly uncaring. Socialism, on the other hand, will be just because everyone will enjoy the fruits of social labour, there will be equality, it will be a caring society. Now, again, superficially, we can have no quarrel with this, and everyone can nod their heads in the time honored fashion. But then I put this argument. What do you mean when you refer to justice, to capitalism being unjust, to socialism being just? According to Lord Denning, who is a capitalist expert on justice, of course, it is quite just to extract surplus value from a class which is economically compelled to let itself be robbed, but it is most unjust to, for a hungry person to take an apple from a shop or for a worker in a bakery to take home a loaf of bread which he spent his day making. Obviously, say our ethical critics, we do not approve of Lord Denning's ethics. Indeed, they would go as far as to say Lord Denning's ethics are unethical in themselves. Now, unless I am mistaken, the only way in which one can expound a superior morality is by having an absolute concept of what is right and what is wrong. In other words, you've got to be able to say my ethics are better than yours because I have something absolute about my ethics, something unchanging, something which will always make them right and always make them wrong, which is contained within them. Now, of course, Lord Denning would, and in fact does, vigorously assert that his concepts of right and wrong are unchanging and absolute. He has written quite widely and would speak quite frequently about his ethics and his laws being based upon the natural law, the absolute law. But... We can look at this problem of absolute justice from an historical angle. 
In late feudal society, the rising capitalists resented the fact that the new productive forces of capital had to comply with the political customs of the feudal state. So a part of the capitalists' rent, interest and profit in late feudal society was channeled into feudal obligations to the economically parasitical aristocracy. The emergent capitalists understandably protested against this. It is unjust, they said, that individual entrepreneurs should have to submit to those who possess political but not economic power. And philosophers like Locke argued that it was just for a capitalist to retain the fruits of his own production. He argued that you shouldn't have any obligation to a feudal state, to landlords, to aristocrats, but only to those who actually controlled and owned the means of production, the means of production being capital. In short, capitalist justice was a class need, just as feudal justice had been a class need. As soon as two moral concepts face one another, aristocratic justice versus capitalist justice, capitalist justice versus proletarian justice, it is clear that the moral is not absolute, but relative to the class interests of the moralists in question. In other words, the the term justice itself is an unnecessary term. What you are really dealing with is one class interest versus another one, that interest being dressed up in the guise of a concept of justice. Balfour bats by applying the analysis of history very adequately explains this point, that justice is an historically formed concept arising out of the developing class needs of different classes throughout history. And here is what Bax has to say on the point. It is just, says the individualist, for a man to be able to do what he likes with his own. Good. But what is his own? The own of the Roman citizen of the Republic included his slaves. These he could cut up to feed his fish, if he liked, and he doubtless felt it unjust when the emperors limited his right to the control of his own property, in this and similar ways, by sundry enactments which, to employ a modern phrase, savoured of state socialism. Again, the donkey is the costermonger's own, but if the costermonger stimulates the donkey's flagging energies with a two-pronged fork, the modern state interferes and limits the control of the costermonger over his property. The costermonger perhaps thinks it's unjust, the state socialistic and the like. The humanitarian thinks it just, and is so far untrue to bourgeois principles. But, says the bourgeois advocate, this does not touch us. We only refer to the things which are products of industry, and which can be, and have been, lawfully acquired. Now, the right to property in human flesh is not admitted in the present day in any sense and therefore it cannot be lawfully acquired. The property in asinine or other flesh is admitted only with certain restrictions. Have a care, O bourgeois. You concede, then, that the concepts of right and justice as regards property have changed, for it was not always so. But no matter. It is just, you say, for a man to possess the product of his industry, or what he has acquired in a lawful manner, and to have the entire control of it. Good. But the feudal baron would not have thought it just to have been deprived of his dues taken from the industry of his villains, whom he had acquired with his lands, lands obtained not by industry, but by violence. At the sack of a town, the medieval knight would have thought it unjust had his lord, in accordance with 19th century notions of equity, magnanimously compelled him to surrender his booty to its original lawful owner. And the rest of the world would have agreed with him, owner included. But these were bad men, you will say. And it is true that the principle of your middle-class conception of justice is opposed to the justice of these men. Therefore, to you, they are bad. Now, there are certain ethical students of Marxism, students of society who are only capable, one might think, of 
judging political theories in moral terms, a number of whom happen, as a matter of fact, to be American professors of philosophy, who become most distraught when they are confronted by Marx's moral relativism, when they actually find out that Marx was not criticising capitalism or proposing socialism in a moral or ethical sense, this causes them to become rather indignant. Nowhere in his writings does Marx say that capitalism is unjust or that socialism would be just. For example, example, the following passage by Marx in Volume 3 of Capital explicitly accepts that capitalism is, on its own class terms, and that is the only way you can ever examine a a theory of ethics, on its own class terms, capitalism is a just society. The justice of transactions which go on between agents of production rests on the fact that these transactions arise as natural consequences from the relations of production. The juristic forms in which these economic transactions appear as voluntary actions of the participants cannot, being mere forms, determine this content. They merely express it. This content is just whenever it corresponds to the mode of production. It is unjust whenever it contradicts that mode. Slavery on the basis of the capitalist mode of production is unjust. So is fraud in the quality of commodities. Now, this refusal to engage in the justice game has so incensed certain American philosophers, <coughs> and in particular I refer to a certain George G. Brenkert, who is unfortunate enough to be a philosopher specialising in Marxist ethics at the University of Tennessee, it has so incensed Professor Brenkert that the poor, bewildered fellow has been driven to written that, to write that. When Marx speaks of the exploitation of the worker, he does not use exploit to connote an instance of injustice. If exploitation does not connote injustice, then what does it mean? What is all this Marxist fuss about? Insofar as the word exploitation carries a negative moral connotation, I suggest that it relates to the lack of freedom which the worker experiences. So, as Engels rightly states, I quote, the conception of eternal justice belongs among those things by which everyone understands something different. In other words, what is economic order for the capitalist minority is market anarchy for the wealth-producing majority. Freedom for us means the loss of the liberty to live on our backs for them. Socialist harmony for one class equals chaos for the present ruling class. These antagonisms are not of an ethical or judicial nature. They are determined by material class interests. Socialism will no more create justice than it will destroy injustice. Indeed, socialism will, in one sense, destroy justice in that it will destroy capitalist justice, the justice of exploitation. The new society will be neither a good nor a bad society in absolute terms. For the millions who are currently starving, production for use will be good, not in an ethical, philosophical sense, but in a material one. It will take away the obstacle that stands between those who need food and those who own it. But for the investors in food manufacturing production, production for use will be economically disadvantageous in material terms because it will end the state of affairs where they can grow rich while people starve to death. In that sense, the eradication of mass starvation will be materially bad for them. So, production for use is not an ethical aspiration. It's not a vision of how society ought to be. In its materialist application, production for use is a class interest which exists in material antagonism to the need for production for profit, which is the class interest, not the ethical interest, of the present ruling class. Now, this is not mere philosophical hair splitting. 
Of course, in one sense, it does not matter whether socialism is regarded as an ethical proposition or a class interest. It doesn't matter at all. In one sense, all that matters is that people prefer socialism to capitalism. But history is not made by ethical preferences. The struggles of the past have not been between rival moralities. To assume that history is made by such ethical struggles would be to commit the idealistic fallacy of those writers of the mid-19th century who were part of the Romantic Revolt, of those earlier Hegelian writers who assumed that the great struggle in history was not between material class interests, but between ideals. No, history is made by the material struggle for existence between classes. The movement for socialism is the movement of the class interests of the working class. The expressions of this movement may occasionally take an ethical form, but ultimately such ethical forms will only serve to mystify the material factors which are involved. In other words, those people who do attempt to advocate the case for socialism in terms of justice and ethical superiority of socialism are ultimately mystifying the real class factors which the struggle for socialism is all about. This brings me to the third ethical argument against the Marxist claim to be a science. And I can refer to something which is a bit closer to hope. At the end of last year, I wrote an article in the Socialist Standard in which I argued, exactly as I've argued in this lecture, that the case for socialism is based upon class and not ethical interests. A reply to that article was sent by a well-known French professor who claims to be an expert on Marxism, written a number of books by the names of, of, uh, by the name of Rubel. His argument was to say that, firstly, the recognition of a class interest is necessarily an ethical action, as is any action which allows a choice between A or B. Anything which presupposes that there is a choice, even the recognition of your own self-interest, class interest, that is an ethical choice. And secondly, that as all previous class movements have adopted their own theory of ethics, so should socialism. Now, this seems to be a reasonable criticism of the Marxist claim to be scientific, and therefore it needs to be answered. To begin with, we can say one thing, that not all choices between competing possible actions are ethical choices. That is nonsense. Whether, for example, I have a pint of lager or a lemonade after this lecture is a choice, but it has absolutely nothing to do with ethics. Unless, of course, I find myself under pressure in the bar from the Salvation Army. So it's not an ethical choice. It is, of course, a material one. If I buy the drink, it will be a lemonade. If one of you buys it, it will probably be a pint of lager. <laughs> so it's a material choice. It is based upon not a theory of ethics, which I have a theory of what is good and what is bad, what is right and what is wrong. It has nothing to do with philosophical absolutes. It is a material choice relating to my own thirst, which is a manifestation of my own biological condition. Now, according to the professor, the choice between accepting exploitation and rejecting it is an ethical one. If one was a detached onlooker upon the exploitation process, I would agree that one's views of exploitation would largely be left to ethical consideration. But the working class, which is the class which must be the historical agent for the creation of socialism, is not in any sense objective in its examination of the exploitation of the wages system. For workers who accept the capitalist interest on exploitation, which is of course unfortunately a majority at present, for them, the privilege of being employed for wages is in their own interest. But for workers who see exploitation from the viewpoint of their own class interest, they 
do not oppose the wages system as an objective evil, but do so because they are the exploited class. In other words, it is not an ethical, onlooking point of view, it is a participative, experiential point of view. It is actually from the scene of exploitation that the working class interest is to oppose that exploitation from the angle of experience and not observation. There has never been, of course, a movement of exploiters who have united together to put an end to any form of exploitation. This is not because of some kind of moral blindness on the part of exploiters, but because material class interests are the basis of decisions and not ethics. The people who oppose the present system of exploitation, oppression and poverty are those who have experienced these things. Opposition arises out of the class experience of these factors and not the ethical contemplation of these factors. So people who have become socialists have not become socialists as a consequence of special ethical feeling, but as a result of the material interest showing them what they have to do, showing them what alternative is necessary. Now, of course, a pedantic philosopher could argue, of course this French professor was such a pedantic philosopher, he argued that it is an ethical choice whether you prefer not to be exploited or whether you prefer to be exploited. Now, if, of course, and he actually argues this point, if, of course, the working class was a class of masochists, if the working class was a class which actually preferred to do what was disadvantageous to its own experience rather than what was beneficial to its own experience, then material development would not take place. And, of course, by and large, material survival is a driving force in history. The desire for comfort, the desire for advancement, the desire for some kind of control over one's own destiny, that is a material generator of historical change. Those who mistakenly think that material needs are merely a matter of choice, then in other words, there are something called abstract wants, which are freely determined by the individual outside of his or her material existence. What they are failing to do is to understand the social nature of ideas and actions. We think about, we want, we need those things which our conditioning makes us think about and want and need. And the need for socialism on the part of the exploited is as material as the need for food on the part of the hungry. We would not, of course, take kindly to a French philosopher who told us that hunger is an ethical choice on the part of the unfair. In precisely the same way, opposition to exploitation, the desire for social freedom, that is not an ethical choice on behalf of the exploited. Now, the claim that socialism must have its own alternative set of ethics to those of the system it intends to displace is based upon an historical misunderstanding about the reason for and the origin of morals and ethics. Belfort Bax's study of the history of ethics, which is to be found in his major essay, The New Ethic, explains that ethical ideas arose as a product of human alienation. In primitive communist society, in other words, in the thousands of years which preceded the origin of private property, human beings expressed their individuality in no other way than by existing socially. The principles of individual existence and of social existence coincided. People lived as individuals for society. They lived socially for the individuals within society. And the manifestation of the self was through the social whole. The emergence of property and the alienation of the individual from the social function, in other words, from the means of production, this led to a conflict between the individual and his society. And this conflict
made it so that society appeared as an external, uncontrollable abstraction above and beyond the human parts which made up that society. Ethics are in fact the code words of alienated existence. Where there is this division between the individuals in society and the society which is beyond their grasp, there has to be a way of manipulating the individual into the class needs of that social formation. Ethics are the means of manipulating the dispossessed in the class interest of the property owners and controllers. And it is only as long as there is this dislocation between the individual and society that ethical manipulation is necessary. The dialectical task of Marxism and of socialism is to put the alienated pieces back together, to return the individual to society, and equally, and just as importantly, to return society to the individual. As Marx put this in his Paris Manuscripts of 1844, and I quote, what is to be avoided above all else is the re-establishing of society as an abstraction vis-à-vis the individual. The individual is the social being. So, socialism needs no ethical theory because, firstly, it is a class movement which exists not to put a new class in control of society and to manipulate other classes into its own interests, but to end classes, to end class interests as such. And secondly, its dialectical purpose is to end the primary moral, ethical problem of how the individual relates to society by synthesising the existence of the social individual with that of the individual society. Well, let me conclude now by making three points about the relationship between socialism and ethics. Firstly, socialists do have a relationship to ethics. Socialists have a negative attitude towards ethics. The rejection of capitalist morality is often the first step towards socialist consciousness. And Frederick Engels, in fact, explains this in his important work, Anti-Jury. He writes, all moral theories have been hitherto the product in the last analysis of the economic conditions of society obtaining at the time. And as society has hitherto moved in class antagonisms, morality has always been class morality. It has either justified domination and interest of the ruling class, or ever since the oppressed class became powerful enough, it has represented its indignation against the domination and the future interests of the oppressed. So, whilst Marxist, Marxists preach no morality, we do indeed recognise that there is a moral struggle to be waged. The weakening grip of capitalist morality upon working class minds, and especially those of the young, is of great political importance to us. Indeed, they're a great political worry to the ruling class for whom maths, ethical conditioning is a source of great social strength. The second point I want to make in conclusion is in relation to the understandable fear on the part of many people that the objective of an amoral society, a society without concepts of right, wrong, good or bad, is bound to equal an immoral social theory, a theory of society where the consideration of people, considerations which are normally connected with the highest ideals of morality, will not exist. And of course, many of such uh, thinkers, including the practice group in Yugoslavia, have pointed to Russia and its empire as an example of an ethically bankrupt society. Not a society which has rejected morality, but a society which has retained a bankrupt morality. And of course, what we can say in conclusion, and this is my third and concluding point, is that socialism seeks to put an end to the individualism which requires ethical defence for one group 
against another in society, one class against another, and it seeks to socialise in a dialectical way the individual social activity with the activity of the whole of society. And in relation to this, there is a theory which Marx, uh, I would regard as the most important of Marx's philosophical theories, which is Marx's theory of the fetishism of commodities. According to that theory, the problem of capitalism is that workers approach commodities without recognising the social history of those commodities, without recognising that the values which they confront in the marketplace are themselves the product of a history of social production. What I would argue is that in a broader philosophical sense, we can take that theory of fetishism and we can say that the values of a socialist society will be exactly the same. They will be the values of the recognition of the social history which has produced the world in which people live, the society, its organisation, production, distribution, and so on. In other words, it will be a value not based upon the imposition of one interest upon another antagonistic interest, but upon a harmony of interests and the recognition that what one person consumes, another has produced. What one person produces, another will consume. And they are as much a part of society together as they may in fact be separated during the course of producing and distributing wealth. And therefore I want to conclude by the second of those quotes, in fact, from Bax, which deals, I would argue, very well, although Bax would uh, define uh, the ethical problem in a different way to some extent than the way that I have defined it, it deals very well with how this harmonising of the individual with society has a place in the socialist proposition. In what I may term a concrete ethic, self-sacrifice can never be more than an accident. The substance of such ethic consisting, as before said, not in the humiliation of self before God, but in the identification of self with humanity. At last, with the dawn of a new economic era, the era of social production for social uses, we shall have also the dawn of a new ethic. An ethic whose ideal is neither personal holiness nor personal interest, but social happiness, for which the perfect individual will ever be subordinate to the perfect society. The test of personal character will be here not self-renunciation in the abstract, but the possession of social qualities and the zeal for positive and definite social ends. This may be termed, in a sense, an absolute ethic. It is no longer naively objective like the ethic of the primitive world when the individual was unconscious of possible interest apart from the community. And still less is it naively subjective the attention of the individual being no longer primarily directed towards the mortification of self, but rather towards the broad issues of social life and progress. He will recognise the call of duty to do and to forbear only in things which directly affect the society, all actions not having a direct social bearing being morally indifferent for him. In this new conception of duty, the individual consciously subordinates himself to the community. This time not a community of kinship, but of principle. Not limited by frontier, but world embrace. One thing we've got to is that you, know, you seem to sort of totally reject uh, the, the ethics. Um, I wondered uh, that if you don't get a change uh, based upon some form of ethics, then you know, do you not get uh, a change based purely uh, upon self-interest? And if you get a change based purely upon uh, self-interest, then uh, given the fact that uh, we do have, uh, shall we say, a sort of uh, bureaucratically sort of stratified society right now, uh, isn't there the uh, probability that you would then get 
a bureaucratically stratified um, uh, form of uh, socialism. And I noted that you uh, criticised this uh, Yugoslav uh, praxis group, uh, as you call it. I think it was a Yugoslav praxis group, uh, because um, uh, they argued um, that very point. And yet your, um, uh, your answer to it seemed to me anyway to be based purely upon faith. You know, you said that um, socialism will not recognise uh, that, uh, it will not recognise exploit- exploitation. That's the question. Hmm. Um, well, on your first point, uh, if I may be so bold as to criticise it on these grounds, there doesn't seem to be a logical connection between your propositions and your conclusions. When you say that uh, what I have proposed is that there should be a, a self-interested change rather than an ethical one, uh, whether, of course, there's an ethical change or, an, or a self-interested one, has no bearing particularly on whether you end up with a bureaucratic society or not. Whether you have a bureaucratic society or not, it's connected with another question, which is how you organise that society. And so, you see, what we're saying is this, that if you want to talk about the ethic of self-interest, um, feel free to do so. Um, I would simply argue that uh, within any philosophical concept of ethics that I've ever come across, uh, an ethic of self-interest would be a, a non-ethic, it would be a negation of ethics. Uh, because the idea of ethics is this duality between sections of society and one sacrificing something of itself for the sake of the other. The idea of a harmonious society rejects a need for that kind of ethical um, uh, supposition. So what is the answer to that problem of bureaucracy? Well, it's quite true that the Praxis group in Yugoslavia, a very interesting um, uh, series of writers who've perhaps written some of the most... Uh, penetrating analyses of, of, of state capitalism from the point of view of people in state capitalist societies. Um, the problem which they have found is that they have attempted to establish uh, super-historical criteria for how societies ought to be. They, in other words, uh, suggested that what you can do is to establish certain principles such as non-oppression, uh, non-exploitation, so society should be based on this. Well, of course, to some extent, you could never run a society on the basis of these abstract principles. You could never run a society which does not adopt forms of exploitation in the sense of the exploitation of resources, the exploitation of machinery, the exploitation of skill. If I wish to you, I mean, in other words, in terms of putting the use of one person or one quality for the benefit of others. What is different in that concept of exploitation to the Marxist definition of exploitation is that, of course, exploitation in a property society is a form of indiscriminate class exploitation. It's a kind of a promiscuous exploitation which doesn't say, I am in a position of domination over you because I'm a doctor and you're a patient who's unconscious and having an operation. That, of course, is a, a discriminating form of exploitation, or of domination, rather. Uh, putting to use the energies of a person who knows how to make motor cars by somebody who doesn't, the instructor and the instructed, the education process, that's a perfectly reasonable and necessary form of people making use of other people, people having some kind of power in an educative sense over other people. But it is a very discriminating form of that thing. What capitalism does is that it runs that thing in an indiscriminate way, simply giving classes powers by virtue of their class position, not by virtue of being more intelligent, more industrious, more skilled. So, how do you avoid having a bureaucracy? Obviously, the problem of a bureaucratic society arises out of the fact that there are people who lack sufficient ability to control society and so have to hand over the powers of control to other people. This is a problem Lenin wrote about it at great length in his final years, which faced Russia after the revolution. Now, millions of people did not understand what had happened. They didn't understand even the ideal transformation of the society they were in, let alone the real transformation that was going on. And as a result, they looked to leaders, they looked to bureaucrats, the uh, the Russian Communist Party had to 
start out with something called the, the Org Bureau, which was a, a, an organisational unit for running things. And, of course, this lent itself to a form of bureaucratic dictatorship, which has ever since been a hallmark of uh, the Russian Empire. But, but, of course, in a society where people are conscious of the transformation which they are undertaking, where they have an understanding of their relationship to society, where they have a, a consciousness which qualifies them for control and mastership, not only over nature but over social affairs, that eradicates the problem of bureaucracy. Now, you may say, well, this is an act of faith, in the sense that um, I am uh, uh, going to walk out of this room and assume that I can get downstairs by the stairs for being there, that is an act of faith. In other words, anything which is based upon some kind of intelligently perceived causal relationship is in one sense an act of faith. The whole science is an act of faith. The assumption that something is going to happen as a result of something else happening is an act of faith. So if you say that something which has not yet been tried is believed to be workable on the basis of the causes tending to look that way, then of course socialism is an act of faith. I would say, of course, what socialism is is a recognition that with certain causes being present, with certain factors existing, such as mass consciousness on the part of the working class, such as a very high level of communication and democracy within society, well, that provides for the possibility of a non-bureaucratic society. And that isn't, you know, to, to, to regard that as an act of faith would be simply to uh, assume that any scientific principle can be reduced to being called an act of faith. Can I, can I just put on one mm. point? Is that possible? Yeah. Uh, I possibly missed something out there, which was you know, just saying, just suggesting that, that, that you know, although sort of philosophically, uh, I, I think it can be said that you know, uh, all non-owners of or controllers, or whatever, you know, with various qualifications of the, the, the means of production, are in the working class. Mm. Um, nevertheless, you know, um, there are sort of uh, many, many factions within that class. And you mentioned the point that uh, you know, it depends how uh, the transition to socialism uh, uh, comes about. And I would suggest that, um, you know, given the fact that all these at one particular part are very definitely exploited, uh, that uh, were you to have a, a move, uh, an, an ethic-free, put it this way, move towards socialism, then you could well have a move which uh, sees the uh, previously sort of uh, less exploited wanting to sort of exploit the uh, previously sort of more exploited. Well, let me just say this. I'll, I'll, I'll try to be brief about that. Look, you're quite right that there's a kind of a, an internal class ethic, even within the working class, because the working class, within capitalism, not being a uh, class which is uh, on the whole conscious of, of uh, possibility and the necessity of socialism, the working class on the whole is a class which is uh, afflicted by the morality of its masters. And it's quite true that because of that, there are ethics within the working class where a professional worker considers that he is above and uh, uh, should be treated with respect by another worker. Now, of course, it is the breaking down uh, of these factions which is necessary to the development of socialist consciousness. And of course the breaking down of these arises out of a recognition of how capitalism works. When the doctor realises that important though he is to society, if the roads were not clear to enable him to get to his hospital, uh, he wouldn't be a very good doctor. He realises that he has a dependence upon the road sweeper. The road sweeper has a dependence upon the doctor to enable him to sweep the roads. Uh, the, bus uh, the bus driver... Uh, in order to get people to work carries people of all different ranks but people of all of those different ranks within the working class are dependent upon the willingness of that bus driver to drive that bus now it's the recognition of the fact that labour is something which even within capitalism is to some extent cooperative if it's not something which is entirely meaningless, it's a kind of a, a coercive Cooperation. It's one where people are actually made to help each other despite their despite themselves, despite the system. The fact of the matter is that of course it's a recognition of this community of interests which has to arise before you can get socialism. And let me just say this, 
It's happening now, of course, to a great extent. Uh, the internal working class ethics of, say, the 1930s, where a school teacher would not drink in the same pub as a docker, because a school teacher probably wouldn't drink in a pub, and if he did drink in a pub, he'd drink in a different bar. And if he did talk to a docker, the docker wouldn't know what he was talking about. That's breaking down. In fact, you're getting a lot of people who are moving out of teaching and going into being dockers for <laughs> very good reasons. So what's happening is, what's, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a few dockers who are moving into teaching on my hand, um, what's happening is that capitalism itself is smashing up these contradictions within the working class. Capitalism is getting hold by the scrap of their neck of the so-called middle-class worker and saying, you might have these pretensions. <laughs> but, you know, all it means is that you stand in the room next door in the dole queue when you're made unemployed. And, of course, with the crisis that capitalism is currently in, one of the problems is that very often the first to go are not the people who are actually in the process of producing the wealth. It's the people who are in the administration. If you think about one of the political paradoxes that occurs to me about the present government, is that the present government, which in popular parlance is a, is a government of the middle class, of the, the, the higher-up administrative professional workers, what is the government's policies? Not that you should throw manual workers onto the double queue. They're all in favour of having productive workers. They're saying you've got to get rid of the administrative layers and the waste and the professional layers. In other words, the very people who give them power are the very people who they want to throw out of work. And uh, that, of course, is part of the rationality of capitalism. I uh, generally agreed with the distinction you made between an ethical concept of justice, i.e. a bourgeois concept of justice, and a materialist understanding of whatever it is. It's really important, but I think it really bursts the mind in something which you were talking about, Steve, which is that all of these actually have, uh, weighing down upon them, uh, class factors. And here, the whole question of class consciousness which is an absolute prerequisite if we're actually going to get socialism, is, I think, extremely important. You said, for instance, in attempt to actually make a distinction between somebody who has an ethical concept of socialism and someone um, who has a materialist uh, conception of uh, socialism, you said, all that matters is that people prefer socialism to capitalism. Well, I would say that that in itself, and that aspect, not just that quote, because I just want to take quotes out of context, but you know, that whole aspect of the SPGB, i.e. that you have to hear the socialist case, you have to uh, convince people, you have to actually play an educative role, I would actually ca characterise that as idealistic and ethical. And I'd like you to make the uh, uh, distinction, uh, or try to actually prove that there actually is a distinction between that conception and a materialist conception of class consciousness. And I'd just like to finish by saying that I think the whole concept of class consciousness, i.e. the collective class consciousness of the class, is absolutely vital if the class is actually, actually um, uh, going to create socialism. Because as Marx pointed out, the class it is anything. It is a collective class. And it's really very important. And that, you know, the whole question of consciousness is actually uh, a collective consciousness. Well, let me say on your first one, I think you might... Uh, a valid point, but let me say on your first point, I know you say you don't want to take things out of context. Uh, I think I can fairly say you have taken something out of context. Because what I in fact said, and I think I said it very emphatically on that particular point, is that superficially we may agree that it doesn't matter whether socialism is an ethical or a material proposition, but uh, in other words, superficially speaking, in other words, on the level... Um, on a very basic level, all that is important is that people prefer, workers prefer socialism to capitalism. Uh, I accepted when I said it that that's a very superficial statement. And in fact, I went on to say that it's a statement which can be qualified to the point where I think it becomes a statement which isn't the one which I would want to put. So that wasn't something I was saying. But what you went on to say was that on the front of class consciousness, I think you raise a very, very important point, because a lot of people, this is the point I was getting on at the end, um, in relation to, to the Paxis group in Russia, a lot of people understandably say, look, ethics is a tremendously powerful force. Uh, you know, again, on a superficial level, a lot of people will say human beings are naturally moral. Morals are very important to people. People are motivated by strong forces. People are 
not motivated on the whole by, you know, to, to make history by, by a, a scratch on their knee or by, a, you know, by, by an itch or by a, by, by, by a minor irritation. People are motivated by uh, all the things that, that you know, Russian uh, novelists wrote about, uh, love and hate and challenges and grand things. Well, I agree with you. And then what happens there is here comes the SPGB, here come these scientific Marxists and say, forget about all that. Forget about all this love and hate and uh, dedication. What is important is this scientific materialist objective. Well, in fact, I would argue that the concept of class consciousness is a very, very important one. Because what the concept of class consciousness says is that you reject these great motivating forces, which are really just the motivating forces, which are the sort of the emotional hand-me-downs of the ruling class. And what you do instead, what you do instead is you develop your own ones. In other words, you know, you often see people who want to be kind of good people. And they say, well, what I've got to be is non-selfish. I've got to be cross old ladies over the road. They're kind of conventional ideals of what it means to be a good person. What socialists are actually arguing is that what it means to be a conscious person is to be (coughs) selfish in other words, out to ensure that you can get as much as you can out of society. And the only way you can do that is not by putting yourself outside of society or struggling against everyone else in society, but by joining together with everyone else in society. And the reason you join together with everyone else in society is not because cooperation is morally superior to competition. Competition may uh, be very good for the soul. What is important is that cooperation is more efficient, it's more realistic when you're dealing with a, an advanced society as a way of organising and a way of producing the social needs. And that's why the importance of consciousness on the part of the working class is not simply something which is a different kind of morality. It's something which replaces morality, replaces if you like, the consciousness of another class being transplanted into the working class, which is what ethics are. And it, in fact, simply says that a working class is going to be conscious of itself, or as Marx put it, for itself. Now, one other point. You say, quite incorrectly, the Socialist Party of Great Britain argues uh, that this class consciousness can only be transmitted to the working class by workers listening to the case for socialism as put by the Socialist Party and so on. Absolute nonsense. Not the case of the Socialist Party of Great Britain at all. Uh, and um, therefore we obviously haven't transmitted that aspect of it to you. Because what the Socialist Party of Great Britain said, it would be an absurd organisation if it didn't say it, is, that it, is in fact the contradictions of capitalism itself. It's a class struggle within capitalism itself which creates class consciousness. Now what we can't say what we can't say, and this is the problem, and I think what we're arguing about is not in the area of what is the case, but I think you're arguing in the area of what ought to be the case. The problem is, it's quite true that we in the SPGB holding meetings like this, standing on soapboxes and whatever ever else, we can only convince a small minority of workers that socialism is something which is in their own interest. Now that is propaganda work which we do and is important to do. But at the same time, It would be nice to think, and sometimes it would in fact be apparently so, that although we are only meeting with this minimal success, capitalism is doing our work for us in a much greater way. That capitalism is producing a hundred times more recruits to socialism than we are producing ourselves. The fact of the matter is, it's simply not the case. The fact of the matter is, what the contradictions of capitalism do show workers is that they've got to struggle in some way and those struggles take the form of CND, right to work campaign, a strike here, tenants association there, whatever else it may be. These are examples of workers saying, let's do something. What socialists have to do, and I cannot see how you can frankly argue against it if you argue as well as you did that class consciousness is important as a prerequisite for socialism. What workers have got to do is to say to people, what socialists have got to do is to say to workers in that position, you won't get what you want through CND, you won't get it through this, you won't get it through that. In other words, we realise you've been touched by the contradictions of capitalism. We realise that you're, you're doing something, you're saying something. 
but you won't get it this way, you'll get it that way. Now, when you talk, and I think it's a victory of, of, of sort of hope over realism on your case, when you talk about the working class as a collectivity, the working class as a broad class, this is what somebody once said uh, in, in, a, in a debate against an organisation which you know well. They said, this is an idea of some kind of universal baptism, that the whole of the working class is sort of going to be thrown into this huge... Um, baptising water of socialism and it's going to come out clean, cleansed and uh, recognising socialism. It doesn't happen like that because we are individuals. You understand so much, the person standing sitting next to you understands so much, the person sitting behind you understands so much and of course we are. Whether we uh, theoretically allow for it or not, we are dealing at the end of the day with individual workers, individual recognitions of the interests of those workers some are conservatives, some are fascists, some are members of CND, some are hanging around the SPGV, some are in it and even within it. Some will have different amounts of consciousness from others. That is going to be the case. And it's a recognition of the fact that it's only by working with people who are going to, in the end, walk away on their own two legs and are going to, when they fall asleep at night, have their own thoughts passing through their own head that you can actually deal with the problem of consciousness. To see some kind of mass consciousness which is going to be grasped hold of in one go is, is, is simply a fantasy. Do you want to come back on that? Very, very quickly to come back on that. Yeah. I mean, first of all, one point is that I do recognise that the SPVP sees the development of the class struggle as being an important requisite for class consciousness. But you've really just disproved yourself when you talked about consciousness in terms of individuals. How... To be sure, not, nobody's trying to actually paint idealistic pictures of workers, you know, entering into a, a new baptism, baptism uh, through the class struggle, you know, clean. You know, if you look at history, that's not what consciousness is about. But if we do look at history, for instance, we look at the Russian Revolution, if we look, for instance, at the German Revolution, if we look at the revolutionary wave that swept uh, Europe in the 1920s, we can actually see... Um, a collective consciousness, a revolutionary consciousness actually being developed. Fair enough, and it lasted a short while. And you made a good point before, for instance, when you talked about the factory councils and the, and the Soviets being superseded by bureaucrats. And that was an expression of the regression of consciousness. So therefore, I just don't see consciousness as a static thing, uh, i.e. that it's just, you know, a baptism. But it, that consciousness lasts... As long as the struggle is actually alive, as long as people can collectively take consciousness from the struggle, that's the way I see class consciousness. You see class consciousness in terms, of, in the long run, although you might admit, for instance, that you know that uh, collectivity and class consciousness and the class struggle has an important uh, bearing on it. You see it purely in individualistic terms. The last part of your uh, of your ten minute uh, contribution uh, really proved that. Also, as well, for instance, on the question of the state, you made a distinction during your speech between Lord Denon's ethics, which you saw as bourgeois ethics, which are completely correct, they are bourgeois ethics, but you actually see policemen as being, um, as being uh, uh, proletarians, you know, and this is to completely be idealistic about the role of the state, and the role of the state, and the role of the state on the suppression of class consciousness, on the whole movement for, uh, on the whole movement for socialism, because it will be policemen. Well, actually, it's stopping it, actually, instituting socialism. Okay. Let me just say one thing about that. You know, this idea of yours, that policemen are workers, well, all right, I mean, we're dealing with uh, uh, definitions here, I suppose, uh, rather like Bax when he was talking about workers. If you think that you have to somehow pass an ethical test to get into the working class, you're, you're mistaken. You're mistaken. I've actually encountered policemen who've uh, got nice, uh, rather more advanced views than certain trade unionists that I've um, come up against. But in the same way, I'd say to you this. You know, I've heard your view repeated several times that, for example, people who are members of the armed forces are therefore part of the state machine, not part of the working class. I simply ask you a good question. Between 1939-1945, as you know, a large section of the working class went into the armed forces. Mobilised. After the work, after 1945, thousands and thousands of them went out of the armed forces. Are you telling me that a worker who perhaps was working in an office had a car, reasonably comfortable existence within the relative terms of capitalist poverty? Are you telling me that that worker who then went 
had to go out with a gun and walk through the mud fighting, getting paid less money for doing it, and then returned at the end of the war to his existence working in an office, driving his car, having the relative degree of, capital, uh, of working class comfort that can be gained in positions of poverty. Are you saying that those workers left the working class, went into a position outside of the working class, and then returned to work? It's obviously a nonsense. Of any class cons- analysis. Conscript army and uh, a volunteer army or a police force. So are you then telling me, are you then telling me that somebody who was conscripted into the army after the Second World War, let's say at the time of the Korean War, went into the army as uh, a conscript, student, shall we say, from Oxford University, whose parents were administrative workers meets up with somebody who is a... and he's a conscript. Meets up with somebody who's gone into the army because he can't get a job anywhere else. He joined at the age of 15, unemployed, comes from... Uh, the chil- is a child of unemployed um, parents in, shall we say, Toxteth in Liverpool. And he meets up with him, and the conscripted soldier, according to you, is not a member of the working class, and the soldier who joined the army because of his poverty is a member of the working class... I would suggest to you that it's a very, very peculiar notion of classes that you've got. And one which, of course, simply doesn't stand up uh, to the facts of, um, uh, of social history. But what I would say to you also is that somebody who admired the Bolshevik Revolution as you do, I'm sure you're aware, therefore, that the leading participants in the Bolshevik Revolution were not only, of course, members of the armed forces, but they were principally non-conscript members of the armed forces. So that according to your own definition, the Bolshevik Revolution, which you admire, was principally enacted by people who are outside of the working class. OK, well, yeah. The speaker said during his talk, and it's a thing that's frequently said by members of the SPGB, the ruling ideas of any society are those of the ruling class. Now, these ideas, they don't just come out of nowhere. Ideas have to be produced. And I've shown you the Declaration of Principles recently. Now, in principle number two, and this told me that the ruling class does not produce. It says the ruling class does not produce full stop, no qualifications, no exceptions. These ideas have to be produced. The ruling class does not produce, principle number two says. Would the speaker please tell us which class does produce these ideas? Well, I'm bound to say that if you assume that the ruling class exists in state of... um uh, without producing ideas, you might also, of course, um, gather from principle two of the Declaration of Principles that the ruling class doesn't produce um, the necessary um, blood to pass to its brain, the necessary air to enable it to breathe, and therefore the ruling class would have died a long time ago. It's a rather about foolish misleading, if I may say. Of course, the ruling class. That's the moment, that we of course, the ruling class produces ideas. Uh, if the ruling class didn't produce ideas, members of the ruling class would, for example, have had the idea of going out to um, the Ritz instead of the um, uh, in on the park or wherever. Quite clearly, um, members of the ruling class producing. But I might actually say this to you. Uh, of course, it's quite true that there are many um, workers who are employed in the perpetuation of ruling class ideas whose particular um, payment for work is quite high on the whole because it is to enable those ideas to be maintained within the uh, um, uh, capitalist system. But, of course, the fact is that the payment uh, for that for that work, the payment for that employment of maintaining capitalist ideas comes out of the surplus value which is appropriated by the capitalist class from the labour of the working class and therefore it is a capitalist class which directs that process of um, education and perpetuation of its own ideas. But if I can say something to you without causing any offence, what I would say is you've got to always, of course, read things however logically um, you are with the maximum amount of recognition that a word um, in a sentence is going to mean different things in different sentences and you've got to be very clear about what it doesn't mean. 
well, of course, that principle of the declaration of, of, of the SPGP is clearly saying is that the ruling class has no need to produce wealth because that wealth is produced by the class which it exploits. That's a clear um, understanding of that, those principles from uh, anyone, I think, who seriously read them. I'm sorry, I must admit, I didn't understand the answer. Would the speaker please tell me, is it the ruling class or the working class that produces the ruling ideas of this society? Well, I, don't want idea, I don't want ideas about going to the rich. I mean, about the ruling ideas of the society. Well, you see, you've got to look... First of all, what are we talking about? We're talking about production of ideas. When we talk about the production of ideas, what we are talking about is the mental process which leads people to think about things in certain ways. Now, what are the ways in which people are influenced to think in certain ways. They're influenced by the education system, they're influenced by newspapers, they're influenced by um, uh, television, they're influenced by universities, they're influenced by publishing companies. And of course, uh, by and large, all of these employ working class people in order to carry out this production. But of course, the direction of this production, the control of this production, and this is an important point, is in the hands of the capitalist class. Are there any more questions from uh, non-members or points in the um, The Speaker, you made a point about the morals of society or the capitalist change. Can you enlarge upon this? Uh, well, can you enlarge it? You stated, you stated that the, the morals of the capitalist class change. Oh, yes. Yeah. Can you enlarge upon that? Yeah, I mean, I, what I'm saying there is that the capitalist class frequently uh, breaches its own morality and occasionally has to update it. Uh, they occasionally have to come along and say, oh, when we told you that this was our way of doing things, what we really meant was this, that, or the other. Uh, for example, uh, members of the capitalist class have had to change their thinking over the last hundred years tremendously in relation to divorce. Um, there was a time when if a member of parliament was divorced, uh, it would immediately lead to his or her downfall. Um, they've revised their morality on that, and it's now something which they are quite ready to accept. In certain areas of the world, they're still not ready to accept it. Uh, capitalism has had to revise its morality about uh, various sexual practices. At one time, it regarded it as being absolutely sinful and disgusting for somebody to be a homosexual. These days, well, you know, as long as you sort of do it behind closed doors and, 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 um, and, and, and not with the Queen's bodyguard, it's okay. So that's something which is, which is you know, it's had to revise the way it sees things. But of course, there is this point. Different sections of the capitalist class have competing class interests. Uh, in other words, um, the person who is an owner of a manufacturing industry he might say, um, oh, it's all right to take profit, but those landlords, they're charging a high rent, you know. And he might say, well, I'm in favour of making high profits by selling food on the market or whatever, but I'm not against charging very high rents for accommodation. Somebody who's a landlord might say, well, I think rent, you know, it's fair, there should be, rent should be all right, but there should be fair prices in the marketplace. Somebody else might say, uh, a landlord who's buying houses and charging high rents, but borrowing money from the bank, will say, rent should be high, after all, accommodation is scarce, but the bankers are quite immoral, they're charging too much. And there's a constant sort of antagonism going on within the capitalist class. And then somebody will say, oh, look, you know, defensive nuclear bombs are all right, but, you know, these Russians are producing offensive nuclear bombs. Or um, if one, you know, when Russia didn't have an atomic bomb, and America did, um, Russia was very concerned about the... the danger and immorality of nuclear we- uh, atomic weapons. Uh, it's changed its mind now. But now that Russia has got chemical weapons and America pretends it hasn't, America is saying, look, nuclear weapons are okay, but these chemical things are going a bit far. You know, they're quite immoral. And there's a constant sort of moral shuffling about. And each time a new form of corruption and obscenity is brought in to play by the capitalist class, they have to revise their morality to allow it to exist. In other words, those are uh, peripheral morals? Well, what is a more central moral? Uh, sorry. You don't know that one. Yeah. 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 This week I just watched some Lenin. And um, 
And I feel that I will have to take him back to the first lecture he gave here mm-hmm. on the um, story of the American. Um, what do you say to a school of thought who contend that uh, learning's theoretical and practical analysis of Marxism um, was based on strategy laid down by um, Placano, you said, in that sense, on the idea of um, monopoly capitalism. Because um, what I understand about this is that um, this idea of monopoly capitalism is a, a, I mean, a way of, I mean, of revolutionizing, if not um, humanizing um, scarce resources or factors of production um, to serve the uh, you know, See, taking for instance um, the creation of cartels and thoughts. Um, I, I just want to know what is wrong with the um, idea of that monopoly capitalism, what you refer to on several occasions here as it's capitalism, um, uh, with regard to the ethic of um, the socialism? Well, uh, very briefly, uh, Lenin didn't in fact derive the idea of monopoly capitalism from, from uh, Plakarnov. There's no evidence that I know of to show that. Uh, Lenin is what built from the stretches laid down by Plakarnov. Yeah, well, I, as I said, I, I would, I would uh, not accept that that was the case. I have no uh, knowledge of that being so. But what I would say, uh, I mean, in fact, um, Lenin's idea was based much more on the German economists and, 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 and their investigations into what they regarded as uh, the principles of finance capitalism. Uh, what Lenin was arguing was that there is that if you brought everything under the control of the state, then the means of transforming that into social property would be much easier. In truth, in fact, uh, although Lenin didn't derive that from Plekhanov, as far as I know, there's a certain amount of evidence that Lenin could have derived some of that from Marx himself. Because, of course, in some of the writings of Marx, writings which the SPGB would reject and writings which... Uh, towards the end of his life, Marx himself rejected, such as at the end of the second section of the Communist Manifesto, Marx himself was arguing a very similar point, that, that by monopolising in the hands of the state the uh, ownership of wealth, uh, there would be uh, an easier transformation into socialised um, ownership. Uh, that was quite wrong. Uh, but on the question about that being an ethical theory, to, 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 to relate it to that in particular... Um, the point about it is this, and this, is, and this might serve as a very kind of focusing in point at the end of this session. What you've always got to do in any historical situation is ask yourself, what can be done? Not what is to be done, incidentally, not what ought to be done. Certainly not, uh, you know, what would I like to be done? What can be done? What are the possibilities? What are the limitations? And I think I pointed out in the first talk, I gave an example, that if I say... Um, I'm hot because that heater is on behind me therefore I will transport myself to Iceland um, that, uh, that's a fantasy historically speaking it's, uh, it's not on if on the other hand I say that heater is hot I'm going to turn it off I'm working within the bounds of historical possibility now what we've got to do and we conf- we're confronted with this often is people who come up and say what you've got to do is get socialism a bit at, bit at a time what you've got to do is kick the working class. First of all, they've got to go for the right to work. Then when they realise they can't get it, you tell them that they couldn't get it in the first place and it's not worth getting. Then there are other people who argue what you've got to do is put all of the means of wealth production in the hands of the state and then it will be easier to get socialism. Look, there's a simple answer. What can be done? We can get socialism as soon as a majority of workers understand it and want it. As soon as the number of workers recognise that the proposition is in line with their needs, that can be done. That is a class possibility now for the working class. So, in a sense, there comes a certain point where you've got to say, look, we're not prepared to take a second best. We're not prepared to take a third best. We don't want a bit of socialism. We want a lot. And in that sense, all of the arguments about, well, Lenin might have had a point, or the Labour Party might have had a point, you know, let them keep their points. We've got a better point. We've got the point of getting socialism now. So we don't want sort of access to the bakery once every two weeks when we're allowed to sit on the board of management. 
We don't want the crumbs from the bakery. We want the whole bakery and everything which is produced in it, and we want it now. And in this kind of ethical question that you ask, the simple answer is, look, ethics is all right if you can't get what you want. It's nice to have these sort of ethical desires. It's nice to have love and hate and goodness and badness and right and wrong. That's okay. What we want is food, clothing, shelter, entertainment. We want the ability to be able to acquire knowledge, and we want that now. And that is, in fact, dealing with the possibilities that exist rather than the ethical questions which, in fact, only divert us from obtaining that goal. 